Hey guys and welcome back to my channel. Yep, I'm hosting on a Monday because this is day one of Mystery Week for Halloween. This week I'm going to be hosting a new video every day, Monday to Friday. Today's case is one that has been so, so highly requested. So many of you have asked me to do this. It's recently come back into the news in the UK and so I think people are paying attention to it. This is a case of 15 year old Rebecca Aylwood. She was brutally murdered on Saturday the 23rd of October 2010 by her ex-boyfriend, Joshua Davis. The media really latched onto this case and not just because of the tragic tale of Rebecca being murdered by one of her classmates, but by the stories that came out around Joshua's personality. One of Joshua's friends had made a glib comment about how if he murdered Rebecca, he would buy him a free breakfast. And Joshua really latched onto this. He was constantly bringing up to his friends, talking about how soon his friend was actually gonna owe him that breakfast. Rebecca lived in Bridgend in South Wales. She was born on the 28th of February 1995 to her mum, Sonia Oakley. She was the oldest of three children. She had a younger sister, Jessica, and a younger brother, Jack. She was really, really close to their family. Her siblings absolutely idolised her. They looked up to her so, so much. And she was really close to her mum, Sonia. They spoke about everything. They had basically no secrets. And this includes where Rebecca got her first ever boyfriend at age just 14. She would confide in her mum about how great this guy was. Joshua Davis was in most of Rebecca's classes at school. They'd sort of known each other from year seven, but it had taken a couple of years for them to form some kind of friendship. They didn't really pay the other very much attention in the first couple of years, but when they became friends, it soon progressed into more than that. Both were quiet students, although fairly popular. They were hardworking and ambitious. They were very alike in a lot of ways, and I don't think it was a shock to anybody Body when they became an item. Both of them had high IQs and they got very good grades. Both were expected to go on and do some really good things with their lives. And so slowly the friendship starts to form between the two. Sonia said that the first time Joshua came round to the house, he was the politest boy ever. He really made an effort with the family. He got on with Rebecca's little brother and sister. He was just a really lovely boy, the kind of boy that any mother would want their daughter going out with. He was good looking with an angelic face, lots of charisma, and he came from a good church going family. Although Joshua did have another side to his personality, one that he only really showed in social situations, showing off to friends, as popular as he was, he also had a lot of people dislike him. He was always the leader, he was the control freak, he was always right in every single situation. And the annoying thing is, often he could back this up. With his IQ being as high as it was, often he was right. He really could do anything that he set his mind to and he could excel at everything, it was just who he was as a person. We all know those kinds of people. In October 2009, when they were both just 14, Rebecca and Joshua become an official couple. They seem really, really happy together. As well as being a couple, they're also best friends. All they did was laugh and have fun. He was very, very protective over her, saying to Sonia that he would never let anything happen to Rebecca. He would protect her no matter what. But again, this darker side to Joshua's personality appears when Rebecca goes around his house for the first time, she sees that in his room he's got a collection of antique guns and knives. But she doesn't really think much of it at the time. Everybody has their collections. But alongside this, Joshua had a morbidity about him. He was fascinated with death and the devil. He would do drawings and write stories all about death and darkness. Joshua and Rebecca were dating for about three or four months. They were really, really happy. One weekend, Joshua came round and spent the entire weekend at Rebecca's house. And they just had a really good time. Rebecca painted his nails. They were laughing, having jokes. And then after the weekend, Joshua just dumps her out of the blue. Rebecca had no idea this was coming. This completely blindsided her. But they were young, they were teenagers. And Sonia was put it down to Josh just being a silly little boy. But Joshua seems to completely, completely turn Rebecca. He goes from loving her and swearing to protect her forever to hating her guts. He slowly begins to turn everyone at school against Rebecca, telling them all sorts of lies about her. He even goes as far as to say she got pregnant and had an abortion, which wasn't true. His dark side really begins to show. He obsessively hates her. This isn't just a case of him not liking his ex-girlfriend. He hates her so much and makes it clear to everybody that he knows. He fantasises about hurting her and says that he'll never be happy as long as she's alive. But people don't pay much attention to this, just thinking it's a moody teenage boy. They think that eventually he'll just move on. 
everyone has people that they don't like that you don't get along with but Joshua took it to a whole new level he would talk to his friends about all the different ways he planned on killing her and he constantly fantasized about it he talked about poisoning her or pushing her off a bridge but all of his friends kind of thought he was just joking and they didn't take it too seriously teenage boys do that they try to one-up each other they try to play the big man and that's what everyone just kind of assumed Josh was doing they didn't think he was actually going to kill Rebecca or that's what they've always maintained anyway in the summer of 2010 so quite a few months after they've broken up Rebecca starts to get really ill she starts blacking out randomly for no reason and so she goes into hospital now bear in mind that throughout all of this Josh and Rebecca were in the same friendship group they still socialized and as far as I know Rebecca never knew how much Josh hated her but while she was in hospital he didn't want to check in on her or make sure she was okay at any point Every Saturday, Joshua and his friends had a little tradition where they would meet up at a cafe and have breakfast together. It was one Saturday, quite a few weeks before Rebecca's death, that Josh is talking about murdering her again. And this is where his friend makes the comment, the comment that possibly pushed him to do what he's been fantasizing about for a long time. If you actually do it, I'll buy you a free breakfast. Joshua latches onto this. Over the coming weeks, he texts his friend saying, you're gonna have to buy me that breakfast soon you'll have to keep your word. To Joshua, this law of a free breakfast meant more to him than Rebecca's life. When they went back to school in September 2010, 15 years old, Rebecca gets a new boyfriend. But strangely enough, even though he obsessively hates her, Joshua seems jealous and he starts to fight for her back. Or so it seems, on Friday the 22nd of October, Joshua texts Rebecca saying that he wants to meet up the next day to talk about them. She thinks that he wants to talk about getting back together and she is so excited. She says to Sonia that he's changed and he's not as angry anymore and that she really thinks they can work this time. The next morning, Rebecca is in her house getting ready to go and meet Josh. She's so excited. Sonia said she was dancing around her room and singing. She bought a new outfit just to go and meet him. She was doing her makeup. She really, really thought they were going to get back together. At the same time as this, Joshua is at breakfast with his friends, telling them the time has come. They had plans to meet that afternoon and so Rebecca sets off after Sonia drops her at the train station. But Josh changes the meeting place last minute. He changes it to a nearby village and so Rebecca calls Sonia and is on the phone to her while she's waiting for Josh to arrive. As Sonia is very confused by this, she doesn't like the idea of Rebecca being in the random village on her own. And so she stays on the phone with her and makes sure that she knows that Joshua is with Rebecca before she hangs up. She asks her twice, is that Josh? Is Josh there? Is he standing in front of you? And Rebecca replies, yes. And the last word she ever says to her mum, a bye mum, I love you. You see, Joshua had a plan. He purposely changed the meeting place last minute to throw people off the scent. He had thought about every detail of this. He walks with Rebecca to a nearby secluded wood. She's thinking it's a romantic spot to get back together. He's planning on murdering her. Once they're in the woods, he grabs her by the neck and tries to break it. Now, Rebecca was barely five foot two. She was very slim. She didn't weigh much at all. Joshua was pretty tall for his age, so he would have easily overpowered her. He fails to break her neck, reporting to a friend later that it was harder than he expected it to be. And so, whilst Rebecca's screaming and trying to fight him off, he picks up a rugby ball-sized rock off the ground and hits her around the head with it until she dies. He leaves her lying face down on the woodland floor. He calls his friends who are weirdly waiting for him outside the woods and they ask if he's with Rebecca. He replies, define with. He's basically saying, yeah, I'm with Rebecca, but she's dead. Joshua then later shows his best friend Rebecca's body. He takes him into the woods just to show him that it's there. This is so little respect for Rebecca that he treats her as a museum piece, something to show off. Look what I did, I murdered her. He's 15 years old. He has absolutely zero remorse about what he's done. Sonia realizes that something's wrong later that night around 5 p.m. when she receives a call from her sister, Rebecca's aunt. Her sister says that she's been trying to get hold of Rebecca all afternoon and she's just not picking up her phone. And this was really weird. Rebecca was a teenager and therefore she had her phone on her all the time. And the fact that she couldn't get hold of her for hours was just a little bit strange. And Sonia actually says to her sister, don't worry, she's with Josh. She'll be fine. 
But this does begin to worry Sonia herself, so she tries to call Rebecca, and again, there's no answer. And so they start to search around for her, contact everyone they know. Rebecca's little sister Jessica starts to call around all of their friends, but nobody's heard from her. Sonia's trying to call Josh, but she can't get hold of him either until much later in the evening. He denies even seeing Rebecca that day, saying they didn't meet up that afternoon. And he says he's at his grandma's house watching TV with a friend. Sonia said that on the phone, he did seem genuinely concerned about where Rebecca was, so he was very good at putting on an act. Joshua had a plan in place that he executed after he murdered Rebecca. He went back to his house with friends where he wrote on Facebook, just chilling with friends. And later that afternoon, he goes around his grandmother's house with his best friend where they watch TV and play games. As the night continues on, Sonia obviously contacts the police and the police are out searching for her all night. The news of Rebecca's disappearance spreads and people start to put their condolences on Facebook saying that they're worried about her and Josh joins in on this. He writes on Facebook about how he feels sorry for Sonia. Please continue searching for Rebecca throughout the night, none the wiser what has happened to her. It was on Saturday morning, however, that they get a tip in. One of Joshua's friends cracks and says to his parents that he's concerned about Rebecca and that he may know what has happened. And so they contact the police. Soon after, the police find Rebecca's body in the woods in Abakenvig, where Joshua had left her. They inform Sonia of the murder and alongside this, tell her that they've arrested Joshua Davis and another boy. At first, Sonia couldn't believe it. Not Josh, she said. She couldn't believe that he would do anything to hurt Rebecca, but he's soon charged with murder. As police looked into his life, they found darker and darker evidence. The gun collection in his room, his stories and drawings about death, the text between him and his friends. But alongside this, they also found evidence that he was trying to make his own poison. He was mixing nightshade and coke planning to use it on Rebecca. He appears in front of Swansea Crown Court in July 2011, not once showing any remorse. He was only 16 at this time and therefore legally classed as an adult, and so in most cases wouldn't be allowed to be named in the media. But the judge allows it. He lifts the order preventing naming him because he believes that it's in the public interest that everyone knows who this boy is. He seems completely uninterested in the trial. He's just daydreaming, staring off into space. He doesn't even dress for the occasion. He doesn't wear a tie or anything. He's always denied the murder. He said that he didn't do it, but he's never shown any emotion about it whatsoever. He just sat in court daydreaming, acting like he just didn't really want to be there. And I'm sure he didn't. In court, his defense blamed his best friend for the murder, saying that it was just a game gone wrong and Joshua was an innocent bystander. But of course, the jury see straight through this. You see the text about the free breakfast and his obsessive hatred of Rebecca. The following messages are between him and the friend that offered him the free breakfast. Don't say anything, but you may just owe me a breakfast. His friend replies, best text I've ever had, mate. Seriously. If it is true, I'm happy to pay for a breakfast. Joshua says, I hope by then it'll be done and dusted. His friend, I want all of the details, you sadistic bastard, ending it with a smiley face emoji. Joshua replies, large breakfast with extras of everything. And his friend says, sick, sick boy. And this is just so baffling to me because although Josh clearly does not show any remorse, he doesn't care. His friend doesn't care either. His friend is happily egging him on to kill his ex-girlfriend. It is just insane that two 15-year-olds can have this mindset. Joshua had no reason for killing Rebecca. Absolutely no reason. He has all of the hallmarks of a sociopath. He wanted to kill Rebecca for his own gratification because it would make him feel good. I think he just wanted to kill somebody. He didn't care at all that she would be losing her life. But considering Joshua's very high IQ and the fact that people thought he was going to go on and do amazing things with his life, his plan was really poorly thought out. He happily bragged to his friends about what he was going to do and also once he'd done it, he took them into the woods and showed them the body. He was so open about what he was doing. It seems he cared more about showing off than he actually did about getting caught. He had a complete disregard for others, not just about Rebecca's life, but also implicating his friends in his murder. Eventually, obviously, one of his friends did have some kind of conscience because they're the ones who snapped and told the police. Even the alibi he put in place was incredibly poor. He thought just by changing the location where he met Rebecca that it would throw people off the scent. He thought by putting up a Facebook status saying he was chilling with friends would mean that the police would have no idea it was him. And just to add to the depravity that is Joshua Davis, just the day before he murdered Rebecca, he changed his profile picture on Facebook. 
and he changed it to a picture of the woods where he would kill Rebecca the next day. That is the extent to which he had thought about what he was doing. On the 27th of July 2011, Joshua Davis is found guilty of murder. He's sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum sentence of 14 years. This means that he could be out of prison when he's just 31 years old. His level of sociopathy is almost beyond belief. It's hard to believe that a human could have such little regard for other people. It's almost a positive thing that he was so careless with the murder and his alibi that he did manage to get caught at such a young age because if he thought about it a little bit more and never got caught, imagine the kind of harm he could cause to other people when he was 25 years old or 30. Would he have it in him to become a full-blown serial killer? This is the kind of person who would do. This is beyond just a bit of banter with friends. This is full cold-blooded murder showing the body off to a friend like it's a museum piece. So if he does get out when he's 31, 32 years old, do I believe that he'll be a changed person? Not at all. I think he could go on to commit even more heinous crimes. Because he did this for no reason other than his own gratification. Something I found shocking was that Joshua's friends, who seemed to know what was going on the entire time, never faced any criminal charges themselves. They were all children and they may have all thought it was just talk, but they waited outside the woods whilst he was in there with Rebecca and... I refuse to believe that he didn't really know what was going on. Even his best friend who he showed the body to didn't say anything. As far as I'm aware, obviously none of these other friends have been named. The best friend who saw the body isn't the one who came forward to the police. To be able to keep a secret like that is almost just as worrying as committing the murder in the first place. His friend just egging him on with the breakfast, that text conversation they had where his friend said that he hoped he had done it. Shocking. This person never faced any repercussions for his actions. Sonia did start civil court proceedings against these boys, but eventually she had to stop because the legal fees were mounting up and it got too expensive. She wants to reopen the case, but there needs to be more new evidence to come forward before the police are willing to do this. After claiming to be innocent throughout his trial and throughout all of his years in prison, just last year, in September 2017, Joshua Davis comes forward and confesses. Sonia says that she was expecting a call just before Christmas to say that he had applied for parole, but instead she gets a call to say that he has confessed to the murder. But she is cynical about it. She said that she thinks the only reason he's confessed is so he looks better in front of the parole board. Shockingly, he's already more than halfway through his sentence, and because he was a youth when he got imprisoned, he is eligible for a free review with a judge. It's called a pre-tariff review. In a nutshell, in this review, the judge will basically have the power to decide if he is to reduce his sentence or not. But Sonia is also going to stand in front of this judge and she is determined to ensure that he spends every moment of his 14 years in jail. 14 years just doesn't seem like enough for somebody so callous and so cruel who could just take away a life for no reason. Rebecca deserved better, not for one moment did she ever suspect that Joshua had any intentions other than getting back together with her that day and it cost her her life. Everyone who knew her said she was so smart, so ambitious, and she was gonna go on and do some amazing things with her life. But I know that Sonia will keep fighting for justice every step of the way. She seems like an absolutely incredible, dedicated mother. And on that note, I'm going to thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed this, please make sure you give it a thumbs up and make sure you subscribe to my channel. I'll have a new video up on my channel every day this week, Monday to Friday, 4.30pm. So make sure you stay tuned for that and I will see you tomorrow. Bye guys.